What's up, everybody? Welcome to Getting Mental. We have the amazing Ali McLean here today, and we're going to be covering a bunch of really awesome, like different ways that we can deal with our mental health. She's going to be sharing a bit on her journey. She's freaking amazing. We had a talk last week, and she's just as real and as awesome as anyone can be. And I'm really, really, really happy to have her here. I'm so happy that we get to to have her wisdom be shared with us. Seriously, she's super rad. So. Allie, would you like to talk about who you are and give a little more info? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and like share my knowledge and what I've come to learn thus far with your audience. So thank you so much, first and foremost. Um, so my name is Allie McLean. I'm a, a naturopathic doctor. So um, if you're not familiar with naturopathic medicine, essentially what it is, is it's a four-year medical degree, just like conventional medical school, but um, our focus is completely different. So um, while conventional doctors usually go into a specialty ranging from all different you know, parts of the body, naturopathic doctors are really focused on the whole body and how the body works as a whole as like a symphony. And while different naturopathic doctors kind of hone in on different areas like mental health or women's health, um, it really always comes back to root cause medicine. So what is the underlying cause behind the symptom rather than treating the symptom, treating the cause? So pretty much any naturopathic doctor you talk to will be really passionate about finding the cause. And we're like master investigators. So that's what I do. I love to understand what's really going on behind the symptom. Um, and in terms of what I focus on, I really focus on women's health and mental health and gut health as well. And all those things kind of tie in together. Um, hormones, when, I, I'm, when I'm speaking of women's health, I'm speaking of hormones. So it's kind of like a nice, um, it's a nice bundle because when somebody comes to me with a mental health complaint or a gut health complaint, usually there's one of the other things going on. So if they have a gut problem, usually there might be anxiety, there might be a hormonal imbalance as well, right? So I get out my magnifying glass and I look at the, the whole person and I treat the whole person. So that's what I do. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. So thanks again for having me. Yeah. Again, I'm so freaking happy that you're here. Last week, I remember you and I were talking about ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. And the different the different things that that can help with treating ADHD, like the different methods because I'm someone that deals with ADHD and I'm always talking about it on my podcast and everything that I do and as much as I think it's my superpower, you know, which is awesome. There's also some days okay, we need to go to the post office. We need to go here and my brain and my body we're going to do dishes. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. Said, what? Why? Why? And so <laughs> it's so fast. Um, but last week we talked about the Walsh method, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that yeah. what it was? The Walsh method? Yeah. Dude, that was epic. Can, can please dive more into the Walsh method for everybody totally. to learn about this? Yeah, of course. It says my internet connection is unstable. So hopefully it works to... Um, everyone, I'm in Tulum right now. So a <laughs> little bit different here in Mexico in terms of connection. But yeah, so Walsh protocol is really, really fantastic. I love using this with anybody that struggles with any, any type of mental health condition. So anxiety, depression, ADHD, it's great for autism. It's even great for, um, you know, dementia it just depends on, depends on the individual, right? So it's usually something that I dive into after I have addressed all of the foundational things, which we can talk about in a second. Um, but with Walsh protocol, really what it is, is there was a clinic that existed in Illinois um, for about 30 years, the Walsh Pfeiffer uh, Treatment Center. And they did research. They have over 30,000 cases of, of patients with different mental health concerns. And they really, what they did was they expanded upon the work of Abram Hoffer. So Abram Hoffer was a physician in the 50s, and he was um, helping patients with schizophrenia with high-dose niacin, which is a form of B3. He didn't really know why it worked. He was kind of just doing it. <laughs> and basically what happened was other doctors saw what he was doing and they're like, wow, you're using nutrients to, to affect neurotransmitters. So they expanded upon his work. Um, so in the case of ADHD, in the case of anything in terms of Walsh protocol, there's really some major things that you want to look at, right? So um, one being methylation, another being copper and zinc balance, and sometimes looking at heavy metals as well, and then also looking at something called pyroluria. So I can dive into each one of those. But the whole point is, and this I like it because it's really like naturopathic medicine, right? No five people with ADHD are going to look the same, meaning like... Right. 
you can't give everyone the same treatment and expect the same outcome because our brains are yeah. different, our bodies are different. So it's yeah. bio-individual medicine. It looks at the bio-individuality of the individual. So you have your genes and then you have your environment. Your environment influences the expression of your genes. And this is the, the term known as epigenetics, right? So we can either turn on or off certain genet uh, our certain genetic blueprint based on our environment. So with the methylation piece of Walsh protocol, it really looks at your global methylation activity. So in the realm, in, in my world of functional medicine and naturopathic medicine, there's a lot of, of attention on individual genes or individual SNPs, individual mutations like COMT or MTHFR. And while those things can be really helpful, it doesn't look at the entire picture. It doesn't look at how somebody's methylating. It just looks at whether or not they have that blueprint there, but it doesn't look at how the environment is impacting the blueprint and whether or not the blueprint is being expressed. So to kind of back up a little bit and explain methylation, it's essentially a molecule, a CH3, three hydrogens, one carbon, and it attaches to proteins, it attaches to genes, different, different molecules in our body, and it affects the way that we basically produce proteins and the way we transcribe our genes. So when you're looking at someone's global methylation activity, there's an inverse correlation between histamine, which is a molecule in your body, and yeah. methylation. So if I were to, to run somebody's whole blood histamine and I saw that it was really, really high, that would indicate that they were an undermethylator and vice versa. If I were to run somebody's histamine and it was very, very low, would indicate they were an overmethylator. And some people are just normal and those typically aren't the people coming into my office, right? So right. that's one of the first things I look at. So in terms of you know um, ADHD, not always, but a lot of times you might see undermethylation because undermethylation is associated with obsessive compulsive tendencies. It's also associated with low serotonin and low dopamine. So if I determine that you have lower methylation activity, your histamine is higher, then I correct that using certain nutrients. And it depends on the person. It depends on how high their histamine is. Like I said, it's all really individualized, but it's looking at the labs and not just the labs, but looking at the symptoms in addition to the labs, because the symptoms are half of the picture. The labs are half the picture. If you go off either one, hundred percent, you're not going to get yeah. the best results because no one's like a textbook. Right? So that's the right. first thing that's methylation. The second thing is copper and zinc. So you can think of copper and zinc like seesaw elements in the body or seesaw minerals. So sometimes they're balanced. A lot of times in the people that I see, like I said, with anxiety, depression, ADHD, they're not. There's something called copper overload. So copper is an essential mineral in the body. It's completely necessary for, for different physiologic processes. But when it gets too high, it basically, um, zinc is what keeps it in check. So a lot of times we see zinc is lower and copper is higher. Copper is associated with um, creating more, it takes dopamine and it shifts it to norepinephrine and epinephrine. So what are norepinephrine and epinephrine? They are your fight or flight. They're your adrenaline, right? So that is yeah. anxiety. So a lot of times with copper overload, you'll see crazy levels of anxiety and you'll see lower le levels of dopamine, which is what you might see when you have ADHD, right? So they're all kind of tied together. And if you see that someone's copper is, is high, generally their zinc is low because zinc increases the activity of another protein that lowers copper without getting too detailed, but they kind of yeah. keep each other in check. So what's cool is I can see if somebody has an imbalance there and I can supplement it and correct it. And it's, it's not just the supplements because the supplements are just, are just part of the picture, right? It's also what our lifestyle is like what led to this imbalance, because it's my belief that we're not like, we're not meant to walk around damaged and anxious and having all these symptoms, we're actually supposed to, you know, be balanced and, and happy people, you know, living our right. lives. So, so, you know, some things that might cause copper overload could be like, um, birth control pills for some women, estrogen can increase, can increase copper, or maybe, you know, that they have a copper IUD, or maybe there's copper pipes and everyone's genetics is, is going to, um, express that differently, right? Some women might have a copper IUD and not have any effects, just an individualized thing. So last thing I want to talk about is pyroluria in terms of Walsh protocol. So pyroluria <laughs> is, it's basically a marker. It's, it's a breakdown of red blood cells and it looks at 
the way that your body is, the most easy way to put it is the way it's absorbing B6 and zinc. So pyroluria occurs when there's a lot of inflammation in the body. Infl inflammation is a general term, right? It could be inflammation from your diet. It could be inflammation because you're really stressed and your cortisol is really high. It could be a lot of reasons why there's inflammation. But pyroluria is the mental, emotional manifestation of inflammation in the body. So those pyro levels start to increase when there's inflammation. And what they do is they bind to B6 and zinc. When they bind to B6 and zinc, the B6 and zinc aren't available to produce serotonin. So pyroluria is associated with low states of serotonin. So the whole serotonin, you know, reuptake inhibitor medication, SSRIs, you know, Zoloft and Paxil and, and those classes of medications might make pe people feel better if they have something like that going on. Also with undermethylation. So here's an important differentiation to make with undermethylation and overmethylation. Undermethylation, we see lower serotonin. So people who are undermethylated generally feel better on SSRIs. However, on the flip side, yeah. overmethylation, because let me just make this caveat. Yeah. SSRI drugs have a black box warning of potential suicidal ideation. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Because we all have bioindividuality. And I wish more doctors who are prescribing these drugs would understand this. But people who are overmethylated, they have too much methylation activity, have higher levels of serotonin. So when you give them a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's going to increase it even more and cause symptoms like suicidal suicidality. So you really, it's really, really helpful, especially if you're struggle, struggling with mental illness to understand what your individual biotype is, what your epigenetic blueprint is. So in a nutshell, that's Walsh therapy. Oh my God. I didn't want you to stop talking, by the way. <laughs> like, I, I don't want you to stop talking. Like that was so mesmerized by everything you just said. I'm like, that is so fascinating. I've never heard of that ever. And it makes sense. So this is cool. Again, i I learned so many new words today. <laughs> Undermethylation, overmethylation, pyro, what was it? Pyro Pyroluria. It's kind of hard pyro to say. Pyroluria. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that is so rad. Okay. So undermethylation, pe people who are undermethylated will have lower levels of serotonin, mm -hmm. you said. Um, and dopamine. Yeah. And dopamine. Now, and you said that you can help with nutrients, right? Like how to stabilize that methylation mm -hmm. with nutrients. What is something that you would suggest for somebody who would be undermethylated yeah. um, and would have all the symptoms of being undermethylated, which would be, what, what would be some of the symptoms? Yeah. So anybody who's struggling with like um, perfectionism or obsessive compulsive tendencies, anxiety, depression, both undermethylators and overmethylators can experience those, those states, but they're a little bit different. So there's kind of like this picture of, and it's not necessarily true for every person, but if you want to put like a, a face to it, the undermethylators would be like, you know, I went the people that went to school, they went to, you know, an Ivy League school and they had all straight A's and everything, everything has to be perfect, outwardly perfect in their life. And they're very controlling of, um, of their accomplishments. They, they're high achievers. Whereas the overmethylators are kind of the people that beat, march the beat of their own drum. So they're the artists. They're the people, um, a lot of times they might have like tattoos and piercings. They have a higher pain threshold. Um, so those are like the, the personality types, not always the case, but sometimes. And so, those, these would be, those would be overmethylators or undermethylators. I'm sorry. The overmethylators are like the artist people and the undermethylators are like the, the high The type A, very. Me, basically. <laughs> people that went to right. medical school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And so overmethylators. Okay. You described a lot on undermethylation. Now, Overmethylation again, the artists, like the, I want to say risk takers, would that be like another characteristic? Maybe someone who's an overmethylator? Yeah, I, I would say more so like people who, you know, don't necessarily care about how they look outward, outwardly to the world. Like they're not trying to get like a perfect, you know, score on, on anything. They're just like, I don't care. I'm just going to do my thing. Like the whole Okay, what thing. if you're both? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's, that's why it doesn't, like that black and white way of looking at it doesn't necessarily like help. It's just a way, like a lot of times I see that people fall into either category, but it's not always the case, right? So like I find 
I find that I march to the beat of my own drum and like, I don't really care. But at the same time, there's like this inner, like perfectionist of like high inner tension. So, and I think yeah. that one is more powerful than the other one. And when I did my labs, I, fo- I found out that I was, that I was under methylated. I wasn't severely under methylated, but I was under methylated. Interesting. So. Because I, man, I'm in the arts, you know, like I play piano, I sing, I dance, I do comedy. I'm an artist like through and through, but also I run my own company. So I have to have that, you know, very structured. I have to be disciplined. I have to have everything in my planner, like 8 a.m., 10 a.m., you know, things like that. Very, again, just like a list. Mm -hmm. But that I had to learn how to do that. That doesn't come natural to me. Mm -hmm. And what comes natural to me is I, I don't care. (laughs) Like what? (laughs) what people think about me. I don't care. Like I'm the person who will dance in the aisles of Trader Joe's, you know, like that's who I am. I'm like, Oh, this is my jam. And then the person next to me and I'll be like, right, this song is bomb. And they're like, yeah, it is. And I'm just like, all right, have a good day. Like that's, that's me. That's who I am. That's I love that. Trader Joe's (laughs) has some good music. (laughs) <laughs> Yo, Whole Foods, the Whole Foods is better. Whole Foods has better freaking music. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, but I can totally relate to the undermethylators as well, where yeah. oh, I, I put so much pressure on myself to do good in school. And I, I struggled with perfectionism for a long time, a yeah. long time until I realized, oh, I cannot, like perfectionism isn't real. You know, I'm just putting like so much pressure on myself Mm -hmm. and it's not fair. It's not Mm -hmm. fair to myself. And at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as much as I thought it did. Right. Totally. Totally. And it allowed me to see much more of my human side that, oh, I'm just, I'm human, man. We're all human and we are trying our best with what we know. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, then you have the little outliers of people who who know better and then just don't want to do better, right? But mm-hmm. we're not talking about that category, yeah. <laughs> you know? But I can totally relate. And so with, with the overmethylators, what's something... Okay, wait, hold on. So back, back to the question that I asked with undermethylation, what are some nutrients that you would recommend for people who are undermethylators? Yeah, Okay. First and foremost, have your doctor do a whole blood histamine test and that you can only get that done through lab core. So it has to be whole blood histamine. It can't be another form of histamine. And once you look at those levels and you work with somebody who's literate in Walsh protocol, then you can determine, don't try experimenting because you could completely push yourself in the other, in the other direction. So just want to give that disclaimer. Um, so with uh, under methylation, you're looking at the main methylation cycle. So you have like methionine, homocysteine, s adenosyl methionine. So with people who have like moderately high levels of histamine, generally methionine is the nutrient that you would give along with calcium and magnesium. Um, but methionine is really part of that methylation cycle. Methionine is an amino acid. So it's really good at... Um, or it's sorry, it's, it's, you can get it from, from protein, right? So amino acids make up proteins. So if you have, you know, a diet that's lower in protein and you're an undermethylator, like root cause perspective, probably want to increase your protein. You know, the people who do Walsh protocol would say, you need to eat, you need to eat more meat. You know, personally, I am an undermethylator and I'm plant-based and I have a high amount of protein in my diet, but that takes a lot of work and effort. So it just depends on, you know, where you're at. Um, and what your what you feel like your body needs. So increasing your protein level. Now, if you have really high levels of histamine, in addition to the methionine, you might need to take something called SAMe, which is S adenosyl methionine. So it's another form of methionine, um, and that one you would take for a while just to get your your um, your levels back down until you can kind of get to a state where you're not so severely undermethylated, and then you just do methionine and you change your diet and all that. So. That's kind of the, the under-methylator protocol. And what is methionine? It's an amino acid. So we have the, the amino acids in our body and it's just yeah. one of them. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's that a naturally a- occurring molecule in the body. It's not like anything synthetic. Yeah. 
that's so interesting because I, I need a lot of meat. Like mm-hmm. I need a lot of protein in my diet. And I've noticed the difference with mm-hmm. my hyperactivity mm-hmm. when I don't have meat, mm-hmm. you know, and or a lot of protein versus when I decide to cave in on like the sugars and I decide to cave in on the the carbs, like bread, like a bunch mm-hmm. of bread or just quick, easy, easy things because I am so busy and always on the go. Yeah, it, it is. It does take a lot of energy for me to cook every single day you know, and try to eat as, as healthy as possible, even though now I'm starting to use my magic bullet more. So I'm able to do now, like do really quick smoothies, which is, oh my God, a lifesaver. I love smoothies. Right. Oh my God. This morning I had a green tea, matcha, banana, spinach, and turmeric smoothie. It sounds really good. Really healthy oh. too. Yeah. That's amazing. Right? I was like, hey, I'm leveling up. <laughs> <Smoothie time>. <laughs> I'm leveling up. Um, but, but what you would call it. Uh, yeah. And I've noticed with my hyperactivity when, again, I don't have the protein that that's something that affects me big time. And I noticed mm-hmm. in my mood too, like I, I will notice it if I'll start to get more irritated Mm-hmm. with things that normally wouldn't irritate me. Um, my, my energy is lower. I'm feeling a lot more lethargic and this is, yeah, when I don't eat meat, this is, you know, and you know what I would, what I would also say that's related to just an aside from Walsh protocol is uh, blood sugar, right? Like at the yeah. very basic level of, you know, why, why do you have anxiety or why are you, why is your you know mood all over the place? Why do you have brain fog is like, how balanced is your blood sugar? Right. A lot of people will get up and they won't eat breakfast for a couple of hours. And what happens yeah. is the blood sugar is going to dip, right? And then you're going to start to experience all of those symptoms. Or you have caffeine, which increases cortisol, which then increases your blood sugar. And then your ah. blood sugar dips after your insulin spikes. And then you have this roller coaster. And that's also a recipe for anxiety. So for those people, and those are like majority of the people, I would say, in, in the world we're living in, in this fast paced world, because if you have higher levels of stress, your adrenals are more tanked, right? You got to really keep your, your blood sugar balanced. So every day being super mindful and not letting yourself get to that state of like hanger, like angriness, yeah. right? eat before that happens. And that's also a really big, a really big thing. And I go over that with everyone I work with, like basics, like here, we're at the bottom of the pyramid right now. What things do we need to focus on? Blood sugar is one of them. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. Per- so how, how can I balance my blood sugar in you a better it. way? Eating, oh, eating more protein. Yeah. Eating more protein and then eating complex carbohydrates and eating smaller meals. So not eating like giant meals, but eating things that are higher in, like I said, protein and complex carbs and making sure you're eating regular meals. So you're not eating, you know, you're not, you're not waiting, you know, until 12 noon to, to eat. Some people will do okay. intermittent fasting because it's like trendy right now. Um, yeah. but wouldn't recommend it to everyone, right? Because some people are going to have those symptoms of blood sugar imbalance if they do intermittent fasting or doing it on the tail end of, of your, of your day. Right. So stopping dinner at like five or six and not eating until breakfast might be a better way of doing it for those people. Cause really like the, the biggest impact of, of blood sugar imbalance occurs during the first meal of the day. So breakfast and lunch should really be like the heavier meals and dinner should be the lighter meal. Um, so. Okay. Okay. I'm learning so much. This is great. This is mm-hmm. awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah and if, and if you enjoy like sugary foods, like donuts and stuff from time to time, you want to live a little um, yes. and eat them. Don't eat it on an empty stomach. Like eat it after you've had a meal with protein and complex carbs and then, and then have it. So that way it's not like spiking your blood sugar and causing all the symptoms of that. So. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. That makes so much sense. <gasps> oh, yo, <laughs> mind blown right now. I'm like, oh, yes, that makes so much sense. I, I'm someone who loves donuts. Like, oh my god, donuts. Ah, <laughs> my thing. I love it and cookies and chocolate chip cookies. And it's you're so right. I've noticed that the times that I do eat them on empty stomachs, mm-hmm. you know, and I do cave in. Yeah, my my sugar will spike and all of a sudden I'll have like this burst of energy, right? Very short lived, very short lived. Mm-hmm. And and then it's this crash yeah. where then I get very irritable. 
mm-hmm. there. And it's like, oh, why? Yep. And now yep. it's this roller coaster. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized that with coffee mm-hmm. as well. I, I'm not a coffee drinker. I'm a tea drinker. I, drink, I, like, I like black tea and green tea. Now I'm starting to get more into matcha um, mm, after matcha. you recommended it. Because mm. I remember you and I talking about, you know, what are some better ways for for me to um, to you know like allow for for me to be more focused, just like things that I can eat or drink, right? And I remember you said matcha green tea, and I asked why, mm-hmm. and you said because it also has L theanine, L theanine, L theanine, and I yo Ali. Ever since you recommended that, I've noticed a big difference in when I make nice. my green tea matcha smoothies. Nice. I don't get the the jitteriness from coffee. Mm-hmm. I don't get the the super big spike the way that coffee, you know, would give worst. me. Yeah. Oh, it the absolute worst. And I don't and the there's like no hard crash the way coffee but give me the crash. Like I, I notice when mm-hmm. it's starting to wear off and I would need another cup of green tea, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's not the panic that coffee would give me. Yep. Right. Yep. And that's me. And I know some people that need coffee and coffee is great for them. And like, yeah. they, they love it and they thrive off of it. And nothing <laughs> happens to them. That's amazing. I'm so Good jelly. You guys. <laughs> right. I'm like, damn, how is it? How is it like to be better than all of us? So, <laughs> Like, that's awesome for me and my body and my chemistry. Coffee is not good for me. And so I'm not kidding. Thank you, Allie, because recommending, recommending that green tea matcha, you know, switch was great. And like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a big coffee drinker, but I started to drink coffee again because I needed more constant, like more focus levels of concentration. And and then that coffee messed me up for a whole week. I actually, I actually gained weight off of the mm-hmm. coffee. Yeah. I, how is that possible? Oh, it messes <laughs> with your adrenals. So if your cortisol is high, then you're going to hold on to, to fat more easily. Your, your energy is going to be con- converted into fat because basically your body's in like, oh, I need to you know, run from a bear mode and I need to store energy because I don't know when I'll have food versus relaxed, calm you know, I can eat and my food will get converted into, into energy right now versus yeah. getting stored in fat cells. So yeah, that's what cortisol does. If cortisol levels are cranked and if you're drinking coffee every day and your blood sugar is balance, then chances are your cortisol is high. Yeah. Oh man. And so what are some ways that you'd recommend that we can lower our cortisol levels? Totally. Um, well, lots of herbs will do that, right? So probably the most popular one is ashwagandha. Uh, yeah. There's there's two stages of that though, right? Like naturopaths and functional medicine doctors, you know, talk with people about this all the time. But you know, sometimes you can have really high levels of cortisol in the first phase of you know adre- they call it adrenal fatigue, but the technical term is HPA axis dysfunction, which stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. So it's this brain adrenal axis and the communication that's occurring. So sometimes those those cortisol levels will be really high, but sometimes they'll also be really low. And that usually occurs in the stage after, um, you know, those cortisol levels being high, which is referred to as burnout, where you just get out of bed, hardly can get out of bed, you feel sluggish and all of that. So in that case, I wouldn't recommend ashwagandha because that would, you know, lower cortisol. I would recommend something like, you know, uh, leuthrococcus, like Siberian ginseng, um, what are some other, some other ones? Any, any herb that is, that is an adaptogen really would be helpful, but ashwagandha okay. would be the best for, best for lowering it and increasing it. I would say ginseng. Um, that's really like the main one that comes to mind. And then if your adrenals are really yanked, one of the best things to do is also support your nervous system as well. So not just, um, you know, taking the, the herbs to lower, um, cortisol, but also supporting, you know, and nourishing your nervous system. So nerving herbs are what do that. So adaptogens help you adapt with cortisol. Nerving herbs will help, um, bring you into a parasympathetic state. So we have the two states of the autonomic or automatic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, yeah. sympathetic, running from a bear, parasympathetic, rest and digest. I'm relaxed. Right. So to shift yep. you into that parasympathetic state, things like lavender, avena, sativa, or milky oat, um, Skullcap is a really good one. 
um, catnip actually is an herb. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's not just for cats. Um, so, yeah. That's so those so are. In- mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's so fascinating. So okay, let's try and figure me out right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do some labs, I- girl. <laughs> What's up? We need to do some labs. <laughs> oh, I know. I I really want to do that. Like for sure. I, <laughs> I yeah. Let's freaking do it. I because let's see. I felt for a while that I was approaching burnout and my burnout symptoms before it turns into like real burnout. I've noticed that it's when I start to be apathetic towards, Mm -hmm. towards the things that I have to do. And I start to kind of dread Mm -hmm. the things that bring me a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh man. And it's, and it's like, it's weird because like, I'm excited to do them, you know? And Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, yay. And then I'm like, ah, I'm like, oh, yeah. You know? And then it's like, never mind. Like, I don't, no. And so, and so that's when I know burnout is also approaching. Um, and then when, when I just have like a hard time getting out of bed, that's when I know that I've, and I, mm-hmm. and I would study myself how I'd been acting like the previous few weeks, if I have been way too much on the go and not resting enough. And it's always when I've been too much on the go. Yeah. So, so with that, you would recommend not ashwagandha, you said. So no, that would be, so yeah, if you're burnt out, it would be more like, um, you know, ginseng, sometimes licorice. If you don't have high blood pressure, licorice can be really good at, at kind of, um, increasing some of the cortisol levels as well. Um, yeah. and then also just nourishing your body, right? Like taking a break, taking rest. Cause we live in this like demanding world. That's not, it doesn't match what our physiology needs, right? Like humans have been so far removed from our natural state and this is kind of where circadian rhythm comes into play. I'm like really big on circadian rhythm and light because light is literally information to our brain. Our retinas in the backs of our eyes are brain tissue that is outside of our skull and it communicates with light. There are light receptors there. So if we have you know, an excess of light at night, an excess of blue light or a deficiency of light in the morning, then our circadian rhythm is off. And the two main hormones that are controlling our circadian rhythm are cortisol and melatonin, right? So melatonin obviously should be helping, helping you fall to sleep and the level should be higher at night. Cortisol should be higher in the morning to get you up and get you going. So a lot of times, okay. the, way to, the way to test for that, the, the gold standard is a four-point uh, salivary cortisol test. So you basically spit into a tube at different intervals of time throughout the day, and it measures your free cortisol levels. And if you see that those wow. are kind of funky and off, then that's a sign that probably, you know, some adrenal fatigue going on or some, some burnout or, and, and, or having a circadian rhythm, you know, dysfunction. So it's really important to kind of get back to nature as much as possible. Meaning like, if you think about our ancestors, they weren't like drinking coffee and like running and gunning all day. So if you find that you're in that state, take the time for yourself, do the self-care, you know, all the stuff that is so important, but also, you know, looking outside and, and mimicking the patterns of light outside, right? So as the sun rises in the morning, when you get up, you want to, within 20 minutes of waking up, get sun on your skin and in your eyes because that's going to okay. actually later on in the day impact melatonin secretion. So it's not just what it does for you in the moment. It'll increase your cortisol awakening response and help you feel more awake, but it will also help melatonin secretion later at night. And then at night, you really want to make sure that, you know, once the sun goes down, you don't have TV on, you know, a bunch of lights right, you know, above you, or you're in your bathroom and you have this like makeup mirror on and it's like all this blue light either like turn all those off and light candles or, you know, go on Amazon and spend $30 and get some blue light blocking glasses as you, as you walk around and, you know, have all the lights on. So you're not getting, because what blue light does is it, in, it inhibits melatonin production. And if melatonin production is inhibited and cortisol goes unchecked, and that's another way cortisol can be all dysregulated and cortisol not, or melatonin is not only important for initiating sleep, but it's also really potent anti-inflammatory hormone like high doses of melatonin are used in some integrative, I don't want to like say this out of controversy, but COVID, you know, COVID treatment protocols, melatonin is antiviral and anti-inflammatory. And um, so those are some things to keep in mind, right? If your melatonin is not regular, you're missing all those benefits of melatonin. And when you're not sleeping, this, this brings me to like another pillar of, of health, right? We have blood sugar and now we have sleep and, you know, circadian rhythm. 
you're not sleeping, it's not only the quantity of sleep that you're getting, but it's also the quality of sleep, right? So are you getting enough time in those different phases of sleep? And if you're a nerd like me, you have something like an aura ring that tracks that. And it tells you like, hey, I'm, I've spent this amount of time in deep sleep, this amount of time in REM sleep. But deep sleep is where your glymphatic system drains. So it's the lymphatic system of your brain and it's getting all the toxins you know, out of your brain and, and you know, into the rest of your body to be excreted. And if you're not getting a certain amount of sleep and certain phases of sleep long enough, then you're not getting that benefit as well. And you have a buildup of, of toxins in your brain. So these, the basics are like the most important. And I find that like 90% of people I see don't have the basics dialed in and just alone getting the basics dialed in before even doing all the fancy labs is like, I mean, the labs are important. Don't get me wrong, but like always got to come back to the basics, especially like if we're talking about giving somebody a supplement or giving somebody a med or whatever it is, or, you know, right. we, that isn't going to be as effective if they're not doing the basics. Yeah. It's going to be like yeah. an ultra bandaid because the medicine, the medicine is in your life. The medicine is in changing the way you're living, right? If you want right. to stop a symptom from happening, yes, you can take a pill. And as soon as you stop taking the pill, the symptom is going to come back. But right. what in your life caused this imbalance? How do you change your life and give your body what it needs so that you don't need all this stuff? That's what I'm about. Right. <laughs> I'm about right. optimization. Heck yes. Oh my gosh, yes. And I remember you mentioning that to me that as soon as you wake up, like try and look even at the sun, just like get those, you know, get mm -hmm. that sun on your skin. And I did that the other day. I walked out with my little smoothie <laughs> and I put my feet on the grass. Yes, and grounding. Oh my God very grounding. Like you said, yeah, it was grounding. <sighs> I was like doing deep breathing techniques and I looked at the sun. And I'm like, ah, my eyes. <laughs> well, you don't have to look but, directly at the sun, but like, just let the sunlight enter your eyes. <laughs> what a big yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that at home. <laughs> I'm like blinding myself. I'm like, I'm doing this for you, Allie. Allie, I'm doing this for you. Oh my God. I'm kidding. Please don't. Please I'm don't. kidding. No. Um, but it really helped like being out and I, every single day I need to get my son on my skin every single day for at least 20 minutes. Like you said, I like to lay out in my backyard. I like to soak it in because that is vitamin D that I'm getting from the sun. Yes. That is serotonin. Yes. That it, that my serotonin levels are going up, mm -hmm. which are going to help me want to get things done too. Mm -hmm. um, breathing techniques, meditation is mm -hmm. huge for me. Mm -hmm. Surrounding myself with good people. That's mm -hmm. also huge in my, cause you mentioned, cause like, like you mentioned, you know, there is no such thing as a magic pill, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Pills definitely have helped. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm all for whatever works for your body. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not anti-medicine whatsoever because medicine has saved my life. Totally. Okay. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. But I'm also not pro just medicine and just have like a pill be your whole thing and rely on that so heavily. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like, if you were to go off of it, then there's no other healthy coping skills in yeah. your life, you know? Yeah. So it's a, ba it's a balance. Yeah. And, and so, and so anyways, that being said, I have, I have numerous positive coping skills that help me and one of them is, yeah, surrounding myself with good people, surrounding myself with people who aren't toxic, people who mm -hmm. are also uplifting, who don't drain my energy. And yeah. I think it's really important to realize who drains your energy and who doesn't. Because recently, my, my next episode on getting mental is going to be about narcissism. Because that was one of the, the things that I studied in psychology. That was actually my field of expertise when I was studying psychology. And mm. recently I went up to Mount Shasta because I had to get away. I had to, you know, like you were mentioning, ground myself with nature and and then come back to this busy, you know, uh, Hollywood lifestyle. <laughs> and, you know, when I was out there, my friends and I were talking about narcissism and we were all mm. laughing about how now I'm able to pinpoint when I'm around someone who is toxic mm -hmm. and my alley, my body will literally go <laughs> like, it'll like, <laughs> like I will literally knock out. And my friends and I were, were joking out there. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, if, we're, if we think we're around a narcissist, we just got to bring Brenda. If the bitch passes out, we're around a narcissist. <laughs> That's crazy. 
That is, but I mean, it's, it's true. Your body is like, so intelligent. Your body knows. Have you heard of the book, The Body Keeps the Score? Yeah, I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's like a whole nother aspect of mental health. That's also stuff that I dive into and it's all about the nervous system and how trauma yeah. impacts our nervous system and how it's stored in our body. So if you've had like previous negative interactions with narcissists, you're going to recognize like once your once your nervous system senses and recognizes that you're in danger and there's imminent threat, you might enter like a frozen state. And then like the, that's exactly what you describe. And that's your body actually like going into protection, going into survival mode. Yep. Yep. And it's it's so interesting. I really want to read that book because great book. Yeah. And I mean now we're now we're talking about narcissism, but like this is this is epic because it has a lot to do with just our body, listening to our body too, mm -hmm. right? Like we mm -hmm. were talking about your body keeps the score. I've noticed that when I'm around, yeah, someone with super high narcissistic traits, someone who's not good to be around, very toxic, not only will I like pass out because <laughs> they like steal my energy if they're in my physical presence, yeah. but I will then, they will literally zap my positivity away. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm, if I'm having some sort of interaction with them, via phone or whatever they will zap my energy i've they experienced will... similar things i totally understand where you're coming from right right and all of a sudden i'm not i'm not the the happy go lucky jolly brenda like all of a sudden i'm just this stressed out yeah like very stressed out kind of zombie like a person because now i'm like how do i deal with this like how yeah. do i deal with this in an emotionally intelligent way um, because don't ever try to get down to a narcissist level. That's what no. they want. Yeah. Okay. They want you to, they want you to fight back with them. So yeah. how, how do we deal with this? Right. And the best way is obviously just not engage and do not be around them, but listening to your body, all this goes back to listening to your body and how important it is to be around people who are positive for you. People who, who are kind, people mm -hmm. who are empathetic, people who are just going to be really good for your central nervous system health, you totally. know, because that, that regulates so much. Mm -hmm. And when I do the self-compassion hug, which I love to do when mm -hmm. I do breathing techniques and all that stuff, mm -hmm. I always talk about how it activates your parasympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. which in turn lets your brain know, Hey, we are calm. We are safe. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, we're okay. We're soothing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but when you're when you're around people who aren't good for you, your body will sense that and your central nervous system will be activated. Your parasympathetic system is like, what? Like yeah. the hell's not, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So surrounding myself is with great people is a, a great positive and hell necessary life, life skill, life thing. Totally. Right. Yeah. My diet, I've been so much better about my diet and what I consume Again, Ali, ever since you recommended that matcha green tea latte, like, yo, like that has helped me tremendously. Good. Um, I'm glad. Exercising. Yep. And exercising too. I have a gym membership now. Exercising is so key even, and you don't have to, you know, go so hard on the elliptical or the treadmill or, you yeah. know, lift a hundred pounds of weights. But as long as you're just getting some movement yeah. in that that will help so much. Also, I don't, I don't drink, you know, that's cool that, that people do. I, I mean, I used to drink when I was younger, but it's very rare when very rare when I drink it, I'll have tech. I'll, I'll I don't know. I, I only would have a drink if it was a super special occasion. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't have things to do for the next like three, four days, you oh, know, wow, it hits what, you that hard. Yeah it hits me really hard where it takes me days to recover and I am lethargic. My, like all of a sudden I'm experiencing anxiety as I'm mm -hmm. trying to recover. Yeah. Like it, it like adrenal fatigue to the max. Mm -hmm. So I'll have, I'll have like half a glass of wine with dinner once mm -hmm. in a while, mm -hmm. once in a while. Mm -hmm. But that's if I'm out also at a restaurant with friends, I don't drink with myself in my apartment. I don't like, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't drink. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me with my body, I've, I've noticed that that's what's helped me so much over the years mm -hmm. that, 
that I don't, that's what also keeps me at a, at a really good level. Um, totally meditation, mindfulness, all of that, that helps so much with, with keeping me sane. Yeah. That's that's amazing. It's amazing. Like going back to what you were talking about with the nervous system, like a lot of like what mediates the parasympathetic nervous system is the vagus nerve, right? So it's this thing that comes from your, comes from your brain and connects to all the organs in your body, like your lungs and your gut and your heart. It determines how fast or slow your heart is beating. It determines the motility of your gut and all that stuff. So anything that impacts your gut is going to impact your vagus nerve. And that's why gut health is so important, right? And diet and mm-hmm. and making sure there's not a constant source of inflammation entering your gut. Because again, that's gonna signal back to the brain. It's a bi-directional, you know, pathway of information that, you know, something's wrong and it's gonna cause that those inflammatory cytokines to be secreted. So that's super important in terms of nervous system health as well. And then all those things that are helpful, like they, they're helpful because they act on the vagus nerve, like meditation, breath work, um, exercise, all of that stuff. And I want to say one thing about exercise, because a lot of people um, will, a lot of people that I see who have burnout have a problem with over-exercise. Like we're, mm. we live in this world where we're like, you need to like go harder if you want more. And like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's not about going harder. Sometimes it's about like taking a step back. It doesn't mean like sit on the couch and be a couch potato, but Like one of the things that recently kind of emerged from, you know, the world of like, I guess, best-selling books, I'm forgetting the name of the book, but it's, it's this book about, it talks about cycle syncing for women. Right. And so for men, they're different, right. They just have their circadian rhythm. And then like 30 days, 28 days out of the month, they're pretty much the same hormonally. Women are different, right. We have our, we have our menstrual cycle. We have our hormones. I mean, if, if you're not on any type of birth control, if you do, then it's different. But if you are actually like experiencing your natural hormones, you have like different phases of your cycle. And in those different phases, you have different energy levels. So if you have like, um, you know, the, like after you, after your menstrual cycle, you have your follicular phase, right. And that goes up until day 14 and then you ovulate. And then after that you have your luteal phase. And so I think it's really intelligent to kind of think about things in that term and in, in that, in that, um, way, because, in your um, follicular phase, that's when your energy is higher, right? So that's when you can go do those things like really intense, you know, cycling class or a hit class or crazy cardio and things like that. And then when you're in your luteal phase, you know, day 14 to 28, or well, I guess ovulation, you have higher energy, but right after ovulation is when it starts to dip down you want to be more mindful of the amount of energy that you're exerting. So there's ways to like hack your, just hack your entire life. The more you understand about your body and its natural rhythms, the more you know what to do versus just being like, well, I think I'm doing the right thing, right? I'm, I'm working out every day and I'm, and I'm not feeling good. Like what's wrong? There's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. You just don't understand that rhythm of your body. And once you do, like so many women I've told, like, just like stop all the hit classes for a month and then start doing it in, in sync with your cycle. And then yeah. they notice like so much change. They're like, I'm doing hit every day and I'm not losing weight. And I'm like, that's because your cortisol is really high and your body's really stressed and it's going into survival mode. Like do it when you're, when your hormones are allowing. And that's, that's the wisdom of understanding your body, right? The body is the most intelligent thing. The body does not yeah. want, the body does not want to hurt you. The body doesn't want to screw you up. Like people feed their bodies the most crappy food, like Capri yeah. Suns and Cheez-Its and their body does nothing but care for them. It takes, it takes that and gets whatever, you know, inch of nutrition it can get out of it and produces the molecules and everything to keep you alive. Like your body loves you. And once you stop yeah. fighting it and you understand it, it's like, it's a, it's a different game, right? Yep. So I'm gonna get off my yep. box now. <laughs> no, this is, no, this is epic. It's so true. Oh my God. As you were saying that, I'm literally just like, ah, oh. I was literally yeah, my body like loves me. It my brings body's you trying- back to a state of self-compassion because that's what it's all mm-hmm. about. Like we, we are always like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Trying to figure out what's wrong. And it's, it's not what's wrong. It's just like, what does my body need? How can I show up for my body the way my body shows up for me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, I'm like hugging myself right now. I'm like, oh my God, this feels so good. I love teaching yes. the self-compassion hug because yes. it's true. Our bodies are here. And I always, any time that I feel like being hard on myself or that I catch myself, you know, being hard on myself, I always go back to envisioning the little Brenda, like a little, my inner mm-hmm. child just going, Hey, like, why are you, why are you doing that? And I'm like, Oh, oh I'm so sorry. 
I'm yeah. so sorry. I you can't be mad right at little here. Brenda, little cute Brenda no. looking up at you with big eyes. <laughs> like, what? what did I do? And it's like, nothing, honey, nothing, nothing. Yeah. You're, you're totally fine. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I love you. You know, and it's so, oh, it, this just feels really good. And that's I our true nature. Stuff. Like that's, that's humans. That's humanity. That's, that's really what the state we're meant to be in. Cause we're in that yeah. state, like our, our, you know, I'm going to get a little wooey here, but our aura is like expanded and our heart, we have a magnetic field of our heart that like extends mm-hmm. way outside of our body. And when we're in that state, that's mm-hmm. affecting everyone around us. And that's like uh, our connection to source, whatever source you believe in, like that is, that's the state that we're all meant to be walking around in every day. And that's what I want yeah. to get people to realize, like, yes, we do this, these nutrients and we do this gut health, but like at the end of the day, that's really your true nature. And that's your power yeah. hopping into that heart source. I'll share something about myself. I recently started, you know, to do my own inner work. What well, I didn't recently start. I've been doing it for a while, but yeah, we started EMDR just to kind of dabble in it and see, you know, cause I'm always recommending it to people. And I'm like, you know what? I don't like doing things that I haven't done. I don't like recommending things that I haven't done. And I love it. Like, and when it, you know, an EMDR, essentially what it is, is you're doing this bilateral stimulation, um, stimulating both parts of your brain and you're reprocessing certain traumatic events of the past and trying to like basically rewrite the story, like rewire your brain. Right. And if you get to a point where you get stuck and you feel, you know, helpless or, you know, just that inner child is like, I don't know what to do. You can call in different resources. And so the resource, I have like all these different resources. One of them is like Totoro. I don't know if you know the movie Totoro, like the children's Japanese animation movie. I'm obsessed. No. I have the pen right here. It's <laughs> Oh, it's, like okay. it's, it's, <laughs> it just, it's from my childhood. It just makes me really happy. And I'm like, Totoro just flies in and save, saves Aww. me. So that's, that's one of the big, big ones, right? Because he like represents this big fluffy furry creature. That's just nothing but love and compassion. But the other one that I always come back to is like my heart and the, the energy of my heart and the magnetic fields, because, you know, everything in the universe is, is in a, is in a Taurus structure. So it's, it's kind of like this, mm-hmm thing it comes in and it comes out and then it comes back in on itself and I I just close my eyes and I picture that happening inside of me and visualization is one of the most powerful things we have available to us right hypnosis yeah. visualization and whenever I whenever I do that little Allie wherever she's stuck I just pick her up and I pull her right out of that situation and she's just like oh like that that energy is, is the feeling energy so I love that I've been wanting to do EMDR and I yeah, I've been wanting to find someone that's good around here where I live, but I haven't found one yet. Um, but yeah, EMDR, that's that's incredible. Do you, from what I've learned about EMDR is when you're in these sessions that somebody will come and tap on your body as you're recollecting some memories. Is that true? That, it can be that, or it can be you doing it to yourself. So I'm doing it virtually. So I'm, I'm okay. doing bilateral stimulation like this. You can tap the sides of your knees. Um, you can do, yeah. you can have your eyes move in, in different directions. You can listen to sounds from one headphone to the next headphone. It's anything that stimulates your body bilaterally. And it helps your, it helps your brain reprocess an event and basically rewrite the, um, it takes the, the emotional heaviness associated with the event and makes it not as intense. Really? Okay. So that's so, it's- so good for trauma because people, you know, struggled with trauma, have like this really intense emotional feeling whenever something triggers that in them. Like, even if it's not that event, they're reliving that event, whatever, you know, facial gestures or whatever it is that your nervous system recognizes and it picks up as a threat will then cause that state in the body. So it helps for that, for that person to kind of rewrite that, rewrite that story. So they don't have that intense level of emotion. Okay. Okay. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and how do you like it? I love it. I've only done two sessions so far, but I'm, I'm just all about anything like inner work oriented. And I've, mm-hmm. I've experienced a lot of different things, you know, in terms of inner work, like another big one, and this is starting to come out on the, you know, on, I guess, you know, uh, in, in medicine and, um, just the, just the general world of people, you know, talking about mental health is, um, psychedelics. So, yeah. um, you know, something that i I find, you know, useful in terms or the reason I think psychedelics are helpful is because they don't, 
they are involved in like neuroplasticity and rewiring our brain, but that's not all they do. They also like, when you're in that state, you get a lot of downloads, you get a lot of information, right? And it's, it's like, here is the thing, like you're, you're no longer in this triggered state where this part of you that's angry or whatever is controlling you. You're completely out of that. And you're connected with the higher self. The higher self just means that there's not a certain part of you that's taking over. And from that state, you can fly over and have a bird's eye view of the situation, right? And it, and it comes at it from a place of compassion, right? You're not like mad at yourself or angry at yourself. You're just like, oh, wow, like I'm doing this because this happened. And like, I have an opportunity to change it, but it really just takes you out of your day-to-day -day and the mundane and it helps you see the bigger picture. And I think that's really useful as well, right? Obviously doing it with somebody who's trained and can help you with integration as well. But um, there's so many different tools available, right? Like nothing against medication, like there's a place and, and a time for it, but there are so many other things that we can do. It's just a matter of how much, how much inner work are we, are we ready to do and how much are we right. going to up for ourselves? So it's true. And oh, I love inner work stuff too, man. I love, I'm like all about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, super about it, man. Ever since I, I mean, hell, I've been doing the inner work since I was a teenager. You know, I've been in therapy since I was a teen and it's, it's the most rewarding thing. It's not, it's not easy. You're literally facing, you know, your blocks, you're facing mm -hmm. the things that have stopped you. You're facing, you're facing all the things that you've been through and you're, you're transcending them. Mm -hmm. you know, you're transforming them into, into positive, like positive things, things that are going to mm -hmm. help you. And in the process, you will, you know, you end up helping others because that's like the ultimate form yeah. of, right. Like yep. getting healthy and, and becoming, I mean, I don't even want to say the word enlightened, but becoming aware mm -hmm. and, and helping others. Like that's, that's just the best thing. So totally. Oh man. Like I can talk about this stuff forever, but that is so rad that you're doing EMDR and I'm so happy that you love it. Like, that's, that's so cool, man. Like, oh, I feel so relaxed right now, by the way. I, <laughs> I love that. So chill. I'm so chill. I love this, man. Like, oh, this is so, so rad. And that's so, amazing. and so back to the beginning when, where we were talking about, oh, give me one sec. Oh, ah, where was I? Hold on, make phone. Okay, cool. By the way, I just checked. It is 12 o'clock. Like, are you okay with that? Can we go just mm -hmm. a little longer? Mm -hmm. Is that cool? All right. Totally. I anticipated this because last time we talked, we were just like, we were just in the zone. So <laughs> hell yeah. Like that's where I felt. Man, Ali, I feel so chill right now. Aww, I'm like, so do I. <laughs> this is epic, man. It's some good energy here. I feel so chill. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So happy right now. Oh, anyways, um, so back to the beginning when we were talking about undermethylators and overmethylators. So we talked to, about undermethylation and ways that we can help with that and help balance that and what but not. What are some things that you would recommend for overmethylators? Yeah, so overmethylators essentially are and I can get into the technical term. So the um serotonin and dopamine reuptake is not really happening there. So you have lots of serotonin and dopamine hanging out in the synapses. So you give folic acid essentially to increase serotonin and dopamine reuptake. So this is why, you know, the, the SNP oriented focus, meaning like the people that focus on the individual genetics, like for example, this person has MTHFR and the treatment for MTHFR is to give methylated B vitamins in particular methylated folate. And if somebody's under methylated and you give them methylfolate, it turns into folic acid in the cell. It's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's a different form, but it, it has a similar effect. Um, then what you're going to do is you're going to further bring them into a lower state of serotonin. Some people respond to it well. Some undermethylators do. It just depends on the person and that's a little bit more individualized. But um, yeah, so essentially it's, it's folic acid. It, the way that you, it's, if you think about it, it's like a building on fire, somebody who's overmethylated. And folic acid is like the fire, the fire extinguisher. Just put yeah. it out. 
Okay. Yes. And those well, are the yeah. people like if they take, if they take um, SSRIs, then they really tend to get side effects from them, like more depressed or potentially even suicidal because it's, again, really? it's increasing that serotonin even more. That's already really, really high. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. And so both under methylators and over methylators, if I'm getting this correctly, have un they they both have lower levels of serotonin and dopamine, but in different ways. Am I correct or no? So the under methylators no. have lower levels of serotonin and dopamine dopamine. The over methylators have higher levels. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they have higher levels. And then how would you know if when someone has you know, higher levels of both versus people who have under. Wait, what do you mean? Sorry. <laughs> like, no, no, totally, totally. So with overmethylators, when you have an over serotonin and dopamine, how would huh? that manifest? You oh, know, how would that manifest? Would manifest? Versus, totally. I know that people who are lower in serotonin and dopamine, um, that would, that could manifest as anxiety and depression and, mm-hmm. you know, feeling lethargic. Uh, feelings of apathy, uh, but with those with the over serotonin and dopamine, would that manifest itself as perhaps mania or what would that? Yeah, it can definitely manifest as mania and you can be depressed or anxious on either side, under or over. It's just a different type of depression and anxiety. Like the way that the Walsh Research Institute puts it is there's like the five biotypes of depression, under methylation, over methylation, you know, um, zinc deficiency, yeah. all that stuff, pyroluria. So with, with overmethylation, it is generally, you see somebody who's a little bit more um, amped, right? So they, they, their type of anxiety, generally what I see is anxiety and they're like, they suffer from panic attacks. Like they're like mm. the really, really panicked people. Um, whereas somebody who's anxious and who's an undermethylator has more of like an internal anxiety. Like they have this inner tension, this perfectionism. And it's just like, it doesn't manifest necessarily as panic, but it's like so much, you know, internal dialogue of like, I'm not enough and all this stuff. And then um, eventually pushes them into a state of depression. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So with the over-methylation, it could manifest itself as mania and panic attacks. And that's, and and all of this boils down to people have to get their labs done and get yeah. their blood work done in order for us to, you know, really be like, Hey, you're an under methylator or over methylator, because mm-hmm. there are so, there are so many overlapping characteristics totally. of both, but they're yeah. for different reasons, which yeah. is what you were saying. Exactly. And therefore when you find out whether you're under methylator or over methylator, then we can treat them with different things, mm-hmm. even though there's a lot of overlapping qualities, just like, mm-hmm. Going back to what you were saying with ADHD, somewhat, you know, you can have five people who have ADHD, mm-hmm. but not everyone's going to respond to just one form of treatment. Everyone's mm-hmm. chemistry is so, 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 so different. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and it's, that's why, man, there's no such thing as one size fits all. Exactly. When it, bio when it comes, bio There's no one diet. There's no one supplement protocol. Like I don't even believe, I guess you could say protocols for this biotype, right? Protocols for the undermethylator for sure. But you can't be like, here's my depression protocol. Here's my anxiety. Like if anyone tells you that it's like a load of BS because there's so much individuality and and variation from individual to individual. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The only thing that I have found consistent that I can say, wow, this is, this will work across the board. The only thing that I have found that's consistent, which is what I, what I teach is mindfulness and meditation. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I have found that everyone, Mm -hmm. everyone will Mm -hmm. benefit, you know, and and it will positively impact people. And Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not woo woo, you know, it's not, no, it's well researched in the literature. Mindfulness. It's got lots and lots of research. So. Yeah. A lot of research and it's neuroscience. It's mm-hmm. literally, you know, changing your brain to adopt positive new coping skills and behaviors, mm-hmm. you know, through our brain's neuroplasticity, which yeah. is the brain's ability to literally change and form new neural pathways, new yes. connection yes. in order for this to happen. And that that's the only thing I have found through my over a decade of research in psychology 
that mindfulness and meditation is so beneficial for everyone who practices it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not, it's again, it's not the, I, I wouldn't say it's like, um, there aren't other positive skills and coping skills that you need to learn as well. Like I said, exercise mm -hmm. and diet mm -hmm. and surrounding yourself with good people, practicing mm -hmm. self-compassion, mm -hmm. which is mindfulness and meditation really like also, but there's also all these other components that, uh, that help. And it's, it's so fascinating that, yeah, there is no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So this is why I encourage everyone to, learn more about themselves, get curious about yourself, get curious about what triggers you, why it triggers you, mm -hmm. get curious about why you feel lethargic on, you know, these days and mm -hmm. what, you know, what makes you feel really happy and, you know, how you respond to situations, what gives you anxiety, what doesn't give you anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, when mm -hmm. do you feel like depression coming in? Do you even know how your body reacts when mm -hmm. you're depressed? So, mm -hmm. Because, you know, oftentimes we think that depression is just someone who is sad, moping around. But no, depression yeah. can look High like functioning. this. Yeah. You yeah. know, depression can be a, a comedian. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not necessarily always someone who hates life, you know, and mm -hmm. someone who has anxiety, you know, doesn't always have panic attacks at all. Mm -hmm. Like someone who can have anxiety can also have mm -hmm. a really big smile on their face totally. and be team leader, yeah. you know? Yep. So just get curious. If, if, if there's one thing that I can say from this episode that I want everyone to take away from is please get curious about, mm -hmm. about you. Get curious about mm -hmm. yourself because that is from a place of self-compassion and love not from a place yes. of what's wrong with me what are yes. some more things I can label myself with just what is it that I need how am I how am I neglecting myself how can I come home to myself how can I treat yes. myself the way I want to be treated the way my body wants the way my brain wants all of that I love that how can I come home to myself mm -hmm. I love that yes mm -hmm. how can I come home to myself exactly what you said Ali coming from a place of self-compassion, like, okay, how can I, how can I make myself feel good? How can I be my best for me? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and, and by that, I feel like I always have to <laughs> lay it down and really explain like, okay. And by that, I mean, how can I be my best me so that I can also be awesome for others and the people around me, mm -hmm. right? Like how, how can I, how can I just be the best version of me? And again, I can't say this enough. Coming from a place of self-compassion, get curious about you, get curious about who you are because we're only here for a limited amount of time, man. Yeah. We're only here for a limited amount of time. Time goes by like that. And totally, yeah. It's, I, man, we cannot live this life going on with, with misery. We can't, we can't go on this life like being miserable to ourselves, being, miserable to others you know we it's life's way too short for that yeah you know it's it and you know what with knowledge comes power man now yeah. that you have knowledge now it's your responsibility and I mm -hmm. always say that you know look for the, the people who aren't aware of this for the people who don't know about this you know then there's only so much they can do yeah because they're not aware of how to help themselves and how to become the best version of themselves but for totally. those who, who do and for those who are becoming aware and who are taught these things or, you know, they stumble upon this information, now that they have this information, they have the choice whether they want to mm -hmm. better themselves or they want to continue. Now they don't have an excuse. Mm -hmm. Now the choice is yours. And the, cho the choice, that's how powerful we are. It's and so I want powerful. everyone to remember that. We are so powerful we can make ourselves feel good and make others feel good and we can also make our see ourselves feel like crap and we mm -hmm. can make others feel like crap mm -hmm. we are so powerful and once we know that once we know how that we are powerful it is our responsibility to try and channel that for the good mm -hmm. it is our responsibility if but and now there's no excuse now for those who are now aware of this and they choose to be 
jerks and they still choose to inflict pain or be negative onto others purposely, mm-hmm. then that that says so much about that person. And that's that's their thing, right? Mm-hmm. That's their thing. And you don't interact with those kinds of people. Yeah. Like, you know, or or you get very emotionally intelligent and you do not let them get to you and you just go, okay, goodbye. Like mm-hmm. not worth not worth my time. Yeah. And that's their that's their journey. That's their that's their thing. And you go, no, goodbye. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and they have some stuff to work through, obviously. Totally. But yeah you can't control that. The only thing you can ever control in this life is yourself and how you mm-hmm. respond to situations, mm-hmm. right? Totally. Like how, you, you can't control how others will react, how others will respond, how others feel, how others will speak to you. Like yeah. you, you, the only thing you can control is yourself, how you respond, how you engage and how important it is to disengage from that. So, you know, just get curious about yourself, man, because you'll be doing yourself so much positive service and in return doing so much positive service to those around you. That's how we inspire people. Mm-hmm. That's how we're, that's how we're able to make a change, you know, not, not by telling people like, uh, how can I say this? Like you need to, you need to change you <laughs> now. It's like, you need to change. It's like, no, you know what? No. By you getting curious about you, you know, and, and diving deep and doing the inner work and, Mm -hmm. and really wanting to transcend and getting out of that victim mentality and realizing how powerful you are. That is how we're going to create positive change. That's how we're going to, again, inspire others to do the same because they're now seeing how it's positively affecting you. Totally. You know? Yeah. And if I might add one thing, of course, we, our world is a holographic projection right? So like Mm -hmm. my world and Brenda's world are completely different. My world and like negative guy down the street world is completely different. He might, you know, find evidence because he's telling himself a story. He might find evidence for every possible negative thing in the world to create that narrative that I'm a victim. The world's against me. um, Everyone's screwed versus somebody else who finds all the evidence. Otherwise finds all the evidence that you know, I am in control. I am in my power. I am sovereign. I am love, like all these, all these positive things. So it's really like, yes, we change the world, but really the world is our world to change. Right. And that's it. Like you said, it's completely up to us. It's our responsibility. It's our own creation. We are creating with every thought we're creating with every word. And, you know, while we may falter, while we may get triggered, we have, we all have trauma, like none of us you know, came out of childhood unscathed. Like we all have something, some people more intense than others, but it's, it's not, it's not anything to compare. It's just your own inner work. Right. And are you going to step up to that, you know, or not? And that's, that's just your life. So I totally agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, yes. I honestly, this has been so amazing. I can't think of a better way to, to end this podcast, by the way. Like this is, this is chill, man. Oh, like, oh, I love, I am like giving you the biggest hug right now. Oh, like, you too. Oh, you're, you're incredible, Ali. I want, and I want people to know where they can find you, how they can reach out to you for your services, how, sure. you know, they can clap. Oh my God. Like, please take, get away. You totally. Yeah. So right now the best way to find me is actually on Instagram. So, um, it's Dr. Allie McLean. So D R A L L I E M C L A N E. Um, and that's my handle. I have a little bio link. So you can, if you want, you know, if you're interested in working with me, you can book a discovery call. I have a little link for that. And that's just kind of where I talk to you and get to know you and see if we're a good fit. Um, otherwise I'm going to be launching a program called um, resonance. It's a four step approach to conquering anxiety that will be coming next month. And if you follow me on that platform, you'll be able to get more information about that as well. I also have an anxiety oriented uh, Facebook group as well, where I go live every week and I, and I share some tips with everyone. So all of that information is there. If you just find me on Instagram. So Yes. Perfect. Yay. And I'll make sure. Oh, geez. Yay. (laughs) And I'll make sure to put, to put your, your handle in the video when it comes out um, and everything, I will make sure to to broadcast that and continue to support. Dude, you're, you're epic, Allie. I'm so happy 
so happy that so we connected. So are you, Brenda. Thank you so much for having me. You're awesome. Yeah. I love it's your energy. Nice. You're so, you're so <laughs> like from the heart. So like, I, it's my honor to be on your podcast. So thank you again so much. Oh my God. <laughs> and I mean it. You're epic. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm okay. Then I'm just gonna, here, I'm going to make like this and go, I'm going to stop recording and then we can chat for a few more minutes after I stop recording and then, sure. uh, so, okay. So we're back. So thank you, Ali, again, you're epic. Thank you everybody for listening. I appreciate you guys all. I love you all so, 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 so much. And, um, yeah, let me, let me know what you guys think of this episode. I look forward to connecting with all of you and have an awesome day. Talk to you guys later. Bye.